Thank you. Dr. Teresa O'Keefe is one of our own. In 2006, she earned her PhD in theology and education from Boston College, and from that time on has been focusing her research on adolescents and emerging adults. Since 2005, she has served the Department of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry at the School of Theology and Ministry as Associate Professor of the Practice of Youth and Young Adult Faith. A native of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Dr. O'Keefe comes from a large and extended family of nine children and married into another large family. Her family experiences contributed naturally to her concern for youth and young adult faith, nurtured even more directly by her experience in faith formation at the local level. Prior to coming to Boston College, Dr. O'Keefe worked for 10 years in the Office of Religious Education for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts. There, she served as a consultant in faith formation, supporting parishes as they attended to the children, youth, and adults in their care. At the STM, Dr. O'Keefe teaches courses on identity, on the practice of ministry with youth and young adults, on teaching high school religion, as well as on educating for justice and peace. She also leads the contextual education program in which students use field opportunities to develop reflective practices that help them better understand themselves as ministerial leaders. Drawing from multiple disciplines, Dr. O'Keefe's intent is to read the context of contemporary culture, analyze its impact, and unpack the complexity of the ministerial setting so that educational and ministerial efforts may be more effectively constructed to enrich the, youths, the lives of youth and young adults. Tonight, we joyfully join Dr. O'Keefe in celebrating the publication of her new book, Navigating, Adult, I'm sorry, Navigating Toward Adulthood, A Theology of Ministry with Adolescence, which has just been published by Paulist Press. In fact, it is hot off the press, Copies are available in the back, but touch them carefully. They're so hot, having just arrived from the warehouse. Um, so congratulations to Teresa for that. An author, educator, and pastoral leader who has dedicated her career to formation in the faith of children, youth, and adults, it is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Teresa O'Keefe, offering the fourth annual STM Religious Education Lecture entitled Navigating Toward a Meaningful Life, Adolescence and Faith Formation. bring this down a little. I'm not quite as tall as Tom, you might have noticed. So uh, welcome. Thank you for coming here. I'm th thrilled to see that I've filled at least half the room with friends and family who have no idea what the topic is, <laughs> but are, are here out of support for me. So that's a great thing. That's a great feeling. So <laughs> just to let you know where we're going tonight, let's um, kind of plot the course. There's going to be three major sections to the talk. One. I begin by saying, what do I mean by adolescence? I think that's something that's often under discussion. It's one of the first questions I get when I say to people I'm talking about them. They say, who do you mean? Then the topic of faith formation. Since this is the fourth annual religious education lecture, it seemed appropriate to speak to that topic. And then the challenge is, how do you get there? How do you get to a meaningful life? Uh, and that's going to be my focus of the last section, with when you're working with adolescents and you're concerned with faith formation, how do these two come together? And I've already met at least one catechist in the room who hopes I have answers for him before he gets to next week's class. <laughs> so. so, adolescence, what is it? I get that question quite a lot when I, when I address this. And I want to simply start by saying I'm considering the long transitional space, the movement from childhood to adulthood. Now, sociologists and psychologists will subdivide that into sections, and that's their purview and their bread and butter. That's fine. And I find their work helpful, no, not to question that. But what I'm looking at is what's happening across this very long transition. It's a very old word, adolescence. Some people will say it only started in the 20th century, but that's not, in fact, the case. It's been around since the time of Aristotle. I think there's the first reference of him using it and bemoaning the fact that they're so useless. But um, 
in, in it, it's always been understood as a time of movement and change. And I would suggest to you, this is the kind of movement it is. We're talking about moving from childhood to moving to adulthood. Now, sometimes we, we know what that means. And that's one of the interesting things in the literature is to discover that when people are measuring the movement towards adulthood, nobody ever says what adulthood is. They usually pick exterior markers like you have a job, you live on your own, you pay your bills, um, whatever else, external markers. And I'd suggest that most of those external markers are largely determined by socioeconomic situations, not by the individual's ability or circumstance. So I had to really think about this when I was um, working on my work, say, well, where is, it, where is it we're going? If I know where the goal is, maybe I have a chance of helping people get there. So I paid attention more to what was expected of adults. And you notice it more when it's lacking. <laughs> Somebody gets older and you're like, what is with them? Okay, so pay attention to that. So when you're looking at children, you see in children an, an, a self-interest, but it's an unselfconscious self-interest. They think they're the center of the, of the world, but they don't think of themselves as thinking that they're the center of the world. They just, think, they just act that way. And in some ways it's charming, and after a while it gets irritating, but it's like, no, you're not the center of the world. But th that's what children do, and it's natural for them. Their perspective is limited to what it is they can see concretely and, and most immediately affects them, even in later childhood. They have a limited ability to see cause and effect. You know, They have a limited ability to understand time. Are we there yet? and believing their parents were around the same time as the dinosaurs. So that's a natural thing of children. They have a limited capacity to see, see things. But older children are able to follow explicit instructions within a limited frame of reference. They can follow your instructions if you tell them to go do something, but they may not know what the intention is behind it unless you tell them explicitly. Right? So pay attention to that. Now, adults, think of the adults that you know, and particularly think of the adults that you think aren't doing well. <laughs> and notice these are the things that you expect of adults. You expect them to consider the concerns of others. Right? You expect them to anticipate and plan for long-term consequences, especially as it impacts the lives of other people. You expect them to follow through on obligations even if you didn't check and say, you're gonna follow through on that, right? You expect them to do that. And you expect them to interact well with others, even without explicit instructions. You, know, you expect a certain level of behavior when they walk into a room like this as to how they will behave and how they'll interact with other people. So what I'm arguing is that in fact, there's a lot of expectations for adults you know, that have nothing to do with those markers. They have to do with, with that expectation. And I'd suggest that expectation comes unbidden. It's not like you wake up one morning and say, okay, I think I'll be an adult. Usually people have already been expecting it of you if you're suddenly waking up one day and thinking that. And, and the reality is, is that when you're failing in that way, people at a point will kind of sign you off and say, I'm not dealing with them anymore. I'm not gonna hire them. Or if you have hired them, you're gonna fire them because they're not able to follow through on the sorts of expectations that you have of them. In very broad strokes, I talk about it as a move from an instrumental kind of engagement and seeing of the world to what I'd suggest is a more relational seeing of the world and ability to engage in it. And it's not simply a, an order of um, qu quantity in, in terms of what people have to know, it's an order of complexity. We need people to be able to engage in the world in a much more complex way. And in that, what I'm saying here is that mature adults need to recognize and anticipate connections among people, ideas, and actions. So what we do as adults, and you all seem kind of adult in this room, what we do as adults is actually very complicated. And it takes a long time to get here, or wherever it is you are. I won't speak for all of you, or hardly speak for myself. So what I'd like to suggest is that adulthood, and you can find this in the newest book, shameless plug, number one. So I came to, term, to, to define adulthood as the capacity to be responsible within the context of relationships. 
And you and I know when we are behaving like an adult, and you and I know when we are not. So it's not like it's a finish line that you cross and say, Yahoo, I got here, as many younger people might assume. In fact, it's a way of being in the world. And so to be an adult is to have that capacity to do this, a capacity to be responsible for yourself in the context of relationships. And those relationships are varied. They can be with an intimate other, they can be with a family, they can be with colleagues, they can be with the person who's running the cash register at Star Market. All of these in some ways are relationships and knowing how to behave appropriately and responsibly within the context of each one of those is in fact very complex work. Congratulate yourself if you find that you do it well most of the time. In that effort, so adolescent, if that's adulthood, then adolescence is figuring that out. And I'd suggest that there are four tasks that are part of it. The first is to be able to recognize oneself as a person, right? That you're an agent, that you're a subject in the world, that you get to act and do things, and you get to make decisions for yourself, okay? But it's also gaining the capacity to see other persons as persons, not as stuff in your life, not as the buyer of groceries, not as the friend who will do things fun with you, that you're in fact a person with a life and a hope and dreams and interests and concerns of your own and a point of view. Okay. And the other thing is to recognize the relationship that's between you and the other person. Now this is, this is, a, this is a tricky thing. Because I might recognize myself, and I might recognize Tom over here, my dean, and I say, oh, there's Tom, there's me, or whatever. OK, I recognize him as a person. But I also have to appreciate that there's a relationship between the two of us, that sometimes I have to do things in benefit to the relationship, even if they're not immediately beneficial to me, like serve on some committee, for example. Okay, you know? <laughs> but it's part of developing the relationship. You know, and it's not simply a matter of, as, as people first think of it when they first understand this thing about relationships, either I get my way or you get your way. It's realizing that what the relationship requires is this something negotiated in between. You know, that neither of us may get our way, but what we're doing is in fact beneficial to the relationship. Okay? That's a very complicated idea and process. So, Getting to know myself, getting to know another, recognizing there's this something between us so we gotta ne negotiate is very challenging. And the fourth task that's embedded in all of those is interpretation. I gotta figure me out, I gotta figure you out, I gotta figure out the world, I gotta figure out particularly what are people expecting of me and how do I respond to that expectation. Right? So to be an adult isn't simply to give people what they've just asked. It's to actually think about it and respond appropriately. So have you come to appreciate how much work you've done to get here? All of these, the recognition of oneself, the recognition of others, the recognition of the relational space between, and interpreting all of those accurately is extraordinarily complex work that we expect to take place during adolescence if you are to function as an adult. And there's very little explicit attention given to that work in most formal educational settings. Okay. However, faith settings can be extraordinary spaces for that to happen. We'll say more about that as we go along. My brother, who's sitting in the second row on the other side, one day we were talking about somebody who was failing to do this well, and he said, they haven't figured out that they're in the driver's seat. They think they're still the passenger in the back seat. And he's smiling over there because he remembers this conversation. All right. So adulthood or adolescence is like moving from the back seat to the driver's seat. Okay? And I thought, that's a really interesting image and a really quick metaphor to pick up. But I thought to myself, it's too simple, it's too easy. In fact, learning to drive is a, is a less complicated task. I have since learned to sail 
And I'll tell you, sailing is a lot more challenging and a really apt metaphor for what it is that adulthood is about. Why? First of all, there are no roads. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have an engine, you don't have brakes. <laughs> And you're working in a world that's constantly in flux. There's wind, there's current. And you have to use all of that to get where you're going. That's extraordinarily complicated work. And much like adult life, the rules aren't clearly set and the signposts aren't clearly out there, turn right or turn left here. You just have to go around for a while and figure, oh, I probably should have turned back there. I've suddenly hit a sandbar. You know, you don't know these things until you're living them. But the reality is, is that we have to figure out how to interpret the environment well so we can figure out, should I have turned there? Or to use the appropriate term, should I have tacked at that moment? And it's different every day. The, the conditions are constantly shifting in life. And we have to figure that out in the moment, at the time that we are doing it, right? And the other thing that I found striking about it is that we're never perfect. Even the best sailors I have since met, they are always learning. And it's fascinating to me that they never feel like they've mastered it. They're mastering it. And same is true with adulthood. You can't say, well, I got that one covered. What's next? Right. <laughs> same with sailing. And it's, like it's something that you get better at, you get better at, you get better at. And sometimes you still make hor horrendous mistakes. Okay, so when we're talking about adolescence, we're talking about a really steep and challenging learning curve to move from the instrumental vision of the world that children do to the more complicated relational uh, engagement that we're expecting of adults. How did we do it? Well, first of all, I think it's helpful to pay attention to the, what is it that allows the human person to make this change. Okay? The brain, a rough sketch. <laughs> the brain develops from the brain stem up and around forward to the front of the brain. I did that drawing, isn't it good? Yeah, okay. The first thing that develops is the brain stem, and this develops in utero, so it controls, resp well, eventually respiration, but heartbeat and some really very basic things. As, we, as after we're born, our decision functioning for much of our life works out of the amygdala, which is in the center of the brain. It's also the place where emotion is modulated. That's a word we can use for emotions. Um, and that's through childhood, that's where most of our decisions are made. They're quick, they're reactive, um, they're helpful if you are in danger, that you respond really quickly to something. Um, but they're not very thoughtful. Okay? As we develop um, through adolescence, and the change starts uh, just before puberty, there is a traumatic new growth of brain cells that happen in the frontal cortex. Okay? And so the human brain actually gains in mass around the age 10, 11. It starts earlier for girls than it does for boys by about a year. And what the brain is doing is getting ready, getting ready for a tremendous growth spurt that's happening in there. We often focus on the growth spurt that's happening in this. It's in here that's in fact more dramatic, what's happening in the brain. So what it's going to take over the next number of years is that new brain cells are grown and then they're going to start being drawn into use. And one of the important things that happens is hopefully, is that, let's see if my thing works here, you probably can't there, is that the brain, the thinking process moves, or the decision-making process moves from the amygdala forward to the frontal cortex. So the frontal cortex is also known as the CEO of the brain. It's the one that makes, it's good at making decisions, it's good at changing its mind, it's good at thinking things through, all right? This comes on board through adolescence, all right? and doesn't come to full maturity in its, in, to the adult brain until about the mid-20s. So we have at least 10 years, closer to probably 15 years, of our brain changing, moving from a child's brain to the ready adult brain. 
And over the course of that time, the brain is getting rewired, repurposed, and, and organized in new ways. Another significant growth, and this isn't, I'm just highlighting a few of the more important ones, is also the cerebellum. The cerebellum kind of adds that the cerebellum's always been there, but if it gets used uh, during this time of life, it actually helps the rest of the brain organize better. So. so the brain is going through dramatic changes, which then allows for the young person to mature in a really helpful way. What, what becomes of this? What does it mean? You gain the ability to look beyond the immediate and the concrete. Okay? You, truly, you can begin to think in terms of ideas. You can begin to appreciate both history and time future. Okay? You begin to recognize values and their inconsistency. And you get a bigger sense of ideas and interconnecting concepts. So what the brain suddenly allows the human person to do is ideate, to think of big ideas, to recognize things beyond themselves. And I often call it seeing the invisible. So the child is more drawn and, and limited to the concrete. The adolescent brain begins to comprehend in the, in the area of ideas, and eventually complex ideas, okay? So, so they're primed over that time to start asking big questions. Where am I? What is life all about? What are we all doing here? What should I be doing here? Okay. And ready, as they begin to recognize it, ready to be part of something larger themselves. So in terms of cognition, in terms of ideas, this becomes an important thing. What else does it mean? Well, the brain's new capacity also allows the ability to see myself. Self-consciousness arises, which was, wasn't there before. So while the child was unconscious that they were the center of attention in the room, the adolescent becomes strangely conscious that they are probably the center of attention and think, of course, everybody's looking at them because they're suddenly looking at them. They see themselves seeing, they see themselves thinking, they see themselves feeling, and they think everybody sees what they see. All right, so it's a time of our life when we feel particularly naked in front of everybody. You know? the, the plus of that is, is that self-consciousness creates the capacity for self-awareness. And that is when you say, yes, I know I came in the room, and I know I have an impact on these people. They're probably not all watching me, but I have to take responsibility for the fact that I'm here, and so on and so forth. That's a, a brief explanation of self-awareness. So the brain gains the capacity to become self-aware, which then allows them to begin to question about who are they and how do they fit into the world, which is something we call identity. They begin to wonder, who am I going to affiliate with? Who am I going to hang with? Who are my people? Where do I fit? Okay. They begin to also have the capacity to share their, a deep inner life. They begin to realize they have one, and they begin to provoke it and grow it, and they begin to want to share it with other people. And in that, they begin to also imagine that other people have a perspective, too. If I have this deep inner life, then maybe you do, too. Now, we all know this. We don't grant it immediately to everybody. We think most everybody else is shallow bores. But then we say, but the people I like, they're deep and meaningful. So it takes a while to, real, to extend this graciousness to other people. Okay, all right. Which in turn creates the capacity for them to empathize eventually. See, these are growing and refining capacities that need to be developed over time. So while they're prepared as I was, Noting a moment ago, they're primed to start thinking in bigger questions and bigger ideas and bigger concepts. I'm saying now they're also primed to engage in relationships for the exact same reason things are going. I have a niece and a nephew who recognize themselves in pictures. <laughs> so who am I? Uh, does anybody care who I am besides me? I hope I care. All right. And there's a ready willingness to be part of something bigger. Okay, I'll stop embarrassing you and move on to the next slide, which is be embarrassing to me. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like the child, I couldn't find a child, I'll use me. So it's like the child who's been in this boat, if a sense, some, that someone else has been driving around, and they look out and they realize, oh, 
there's a world out there. And people are starting to expect things of me. And what's interesting in adolescence, we've been there, but we see it also in the adolescents we work with, they usually feel it before they can name it. And they feel it in the sense of people's expectations. And they get frustrated and angry because they know it's there even though they don't even know why. And I'd suggest to you they're suddenly seeing people's expectations, feeling it. You know, a parent could have been saying to their son or daughter, for years would you please pick up your stuff? But they're suddenly hearing it and realizing, hey, why are you on my case? I'm like, I've been on your case for five years. <laughs> but suddenly they're, they're seeing it and feeling it and, and upset about not knowing how to respond to it. So as they look out of the edge of the boat and begin to see the world, it, be, it becomes an opportunity to make new sense in a new way, but it also becomes a time of extraordinary anxiety for the very same reason, okay? Now, having said that all of that is possible, none of it is inevitable. Sometimes you just get older and remain instrumental in your thinking. Sometimes you just get older and think you're the center of the world. Unfortunately, then you just get more savvy at it. How do I manipulate the world to serve my purposes? How do I never take the blame for anything? How do I use people for what I need to get ahead? I'm not interested in helping people grow like that, and I wouldn't expect you are either. So I'm saying, what is it you do to help people grow and mature They'll age on their own, right? How do you help them grow and mature? So, as promised, I'm gonna let you pause for a, a moment here and think, you've heard me talk long enough. So let's stop for a moment and just gather some thoughts for yourself. I have a few questions up there. Just recall back, what were the concerns that arose within you when you were an adolescent? Some of you are closer to that than others in this room, I recognize. What were your big questions at that time? And the important question behind that is to pay attention to, can you identify how your questions and concerns were different, more expansive, and never had occurred to you in childhood? Right? So let's pause a moment here. Think about that for yourselves. And then I'm going to give you a ch chance to chat with somebody who's not me about that. If you, and if you have too embarrassed to say anything, you can listen to the other. <laughs> let's just take a short, short little pause here. Just want to, I don't want any embarrassing stories, or unless you're choosing to embarrass yourself, that's your, I suppose, your own. But remember, this will be on film for your children and your children's children. Um, but does anyone want to say anything about how the, how the questions and concerns of their adolescence were, they, realize, they recognize were very different from they were as children? Anybody have to say one or two? My name is Joe Cabadas. I'm a member of Pax Christi, the Catholic Peace Group. I'm a veteran for peace. Mm -hmm. And my adolescence was covered by the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, the draft, and uh, going to college to avoid the draft, and then winning a lottery and going into the military. Mm -hmm. And then going to Vietnam as, as well. Mm -hmm. So that was, and then in the end, I, I, I was trained as a psychiatric medic, and they brought me I uh, got me a job at McLean Hospital, and I worked there for 36 years. Mm -hmm. So, so some respect. Doesn't quite, thank you for that history and for that, but how does that address the question? What was a concern that was different for you in your childhood? You certainly said this was a social situation, a historic moment that was different. Right. But can you see how your own concerns were changing in that time? Besides the fact that you were concerned about getting drafted. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I was brought up in South Boston, which was, um, very militaristic, mm -hmm. Irish Catholic. 25 of my uh, neighbors got killed in Vietnam, one of the highest rates of any part of the country. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of pressure for um, military, as well as growing up with a lot of um, 
uh, veterans from World War II. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was a lot of militarism. And then going to college, there was anti-militarism. So mm -hmm. I was caught in between both uh, going and not going. Great. Thank you. So that Thank was you. the... Uh, right. So... One of the things I'm hearing in that is, and this is a really appropriate thing, he's got two different, in a sense, worlds competing, but the more formative one is saying, well, of course, we're gonna, you're going to be in the military. This is what we do, right? So, again, as a child, you're not as aware of those things, but as an adolescent, you begin to realize, I've got to be a part of this somehow. Okay, a Catholic, a Catholic school student for my entire life, and as a child, in elementary school, it was Sister Says. Mm -hmm. Come high school, we were really asking some rather serious faith questions. And the good sister who was teaching religion couldn't answer those questions. And she had been a convert from Protestantism mm -hmm. to Catholicism and then became a religious woman. And my classmates and I could not possibly understand how she could have made those decisions without knowing the answers to the questions mm. that we were asking. Mm -hmm. So it was a whole different way of looking at it. Yeah, but what's interesting in that, thank you. What's interesting in that is, as a child able to say, okay, here's the question, here's the answer, and I'm presuming in that Baltimore Catechism training, right? Um, and so there are, there are questions, there are answers. We don't need to work beyond that. So that shows you, and it's a good illustration of kind of the concrete seeing of the child, who's perfectly satisfied for whatever reason. If these are your questions, these are your answers, I'm happy with that. You get to the adolescent in high school saying, yeah, but why about this and why about that? And so to ask provocative questions that aren't in the book can be distressing to the teacher who's like, I don't know anything beyond the book. <laughs> yeah. We famously have an aunt who says she was excommunicated who knows how many times while she was in high school because she asked questions that weren't in the book and, and sister couldn't answer them. But that's the nature of adolescence, to begin to ask questions and not just say, well, it's in the book, just answer them. Now granted, you're gonna have younger adolescents who say, listen, I don't know what your question is, it's in the book. Why are you asking other questions? But you're gonna have others who are very provoking and provocative and pushing and that's an indication of the maturation process. Okay, anyone else want to add something? Oh, geez, my brother over here. This is good, this, this may be embarrassing for me. Hey there. <laughs> so as I, <laughs> I was laughing here with some of my other relatives, but uh, as, I, as I reflect on the question, I think my view of the world was really very small. It was uh, um, more concerned about just hanging out with my buddy Fitzy and, and, uh, you know, whatever trouble we we're going to get into that day, but it was a very, you know, provincial perspective of the world of, you know, whatever we were doing uh, today. You know, never listened to the news, wasn't really a perspective of mine. Um, you know, the big questions that, of the time for us were, are we going to get caught doing this? Mm -hmm. you know? um, which is, you know, very different from today, where, you know, as an adult, you're thinking much more long term and, and you know what are all the different things going on in my life and how they how they play out. But as an adolescent, it wasn't much further than you know my best friend and what we're going to do in the next hour. Right, right, and that's exactly right. One of my favorite theorists is Robert Keegan on developmental theory, and he talks about second order and third order. And I'd suggest that adolescence is that shifting from maybe second to third order. And second order is only concerned about uh, if I do this, do I get caught? They're not concerned about what's behind this. They're not thinking long-term consequences, not even as far as who's going to get hurt or will, will somebody be upset with me, which are more relational kinds of questions. That can come later in adolescence, depends on who it is and who's prompting and supporting that change. But these, all of these things we're talking about, a limited worldview, a limited sense of concerns, uh, satisfied with simple answers, that's very natural for children. But in adolescence, the world begins to push you, you begin to get pushed to start thinking in bigger and more expansive ways. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Now, so you can begin to appreciate and that your own adolescence was, I'm sure, a very rich time and a huge transitional space, right? Then the question becomes, well, what do you do about faith formation? 
You know, if you're this is a topic, adolescence and faith formation. Um, some people might say, well, this is the hardest population to deal with. And the reason that it's the harder population to deal with is because they're not children anymore. And you can't just say, here, here are the answers. <laughs> Study them and pass the test. Or even if you're not even sure there is a test, like, I'm not sure. But anyway, the point is, is that adolescents, because they're potentially inquiring, they put a whole different spin. Even if they're inquiring about the worth of religious education. So the first thing that we have to deal with, though, is, I mean, really? Religious education in this day and age? Oh, come on. First of all, nobody's here, right? So <laughs> Pew Research indicates that more and more people are not showing up in more and more religious places. Okay? What's interesting to me that in the, in the research that's this year, 2018, they're suggesting that 32% of Massachusetts residents will describe themselves as nuns, meaning people who have no religious affiliation. Now, I wasn't expecting you to read all that fine print on there. Um, but that's an important thing for us to pay attention to, and it makes it much more challenging. Right? The other part of that is among Catholics, is this the number, quote number two there, item number two, Catholicism has experienced a greater net loss due to religious switching than any other religious tradition in the US. Now you start with the fact that it's a very large religious community in the U.S., but so it has opportunity to lose more people, right? And so the Pew Research indicates for us that 34% of Massachusetts residents identify as Catholic. So only 2% more than identify as nuns. That's significant. And, and Massachusetts is one of the most Catholic states in the country. It's only really surpassed by Rhode Island, which is about 41%. So here we are, the largest concentration of Catholics, one of the largest concentrations of the Catholics in the country. So what are we going to do? And why is this the case? And the largest decline happens among adolescents and emerging adulthood, so that, which is the later adolescence in my book. So it happens anywhere between the ages of 13 and 22. This is the biggest drop off. Why? Well, one I'd suggest is because they outgrow God. They outgrow the image of God that they have in their head. Don't you love Gary Larson? Okay. <laughs> this concept of God as some guy in the heavens who does stuff uh, is no longer helpful. Okay. Uh, Christian Smith, in his book Soul Searching, that he published in 2005, uh, he came to name this image of God that he found among some adolescents between the ages of 13 and 17 years old is what he called moralistic therapeutic deism. And basically, some other people have called it God the butler. He's there when I need him, and he's always a he. He's there when I need him, but if I don't need him, he's not here. I don't have to worry about him. He's not going to demand anything of me. Um, you know, He just lets me get on with my life otherwise. But if I need something, I can call on him, and he probably should do something helpful. But he's not at all demanding. Well, how could he be demanding? His job is to help me, not to be demanding of me. So this image of God, I suggest, is also a very childish image of God. And what's unfortunate for us is that we haven't done much work to replace it with anything more robust and appropriate for an adult. And so that's really the challenge of us and in the church. But that's also largely more of a cultural reality, too, because and this is a, a New York Times article that was in uh, the paper just the other day, that this author is bemoaning the fact that it's harder to talk about God because the culture, even though we call ourselves a Christian country, in the culture, people don't even know what these words mean anymore. So when he talks about sin and kindness and grace, people are like, I don't know what that's about, and redemption and salvation. So we've lost a parlance with the Christian uh, language in a way that people can make sense of it in a deep and rich sort of way. Okay, So there's a lot that contribute to it. And let's not forget this. Oh, yeah. The fact that we have had this significant um, exposure of a crisis of sexual abuse of children and others um, by the clergy and the cover up the clergy has been extraordinarily damaging for the church and its membership, but also for the faith of individuals. Okay. 
We know it here uh, first in 2001, 2002, when it came out here in Boston, and we're just getting a, a lovely, huge renewal this year. So it makes it really challenging to even talk about faith formation. And many of you, I, exper I expect, have had the experience of people asking you, why would you go to church? Are you nuts? What's that all about? And those of you who are in religious leadership know it firsthand. You have a, spend a lot of time trying to can, talk to other people about why you do, and you, which means you also spend a lot of time talking to yourself, saying, why do I? Why do I? Right? So a couple of dangers here. One is the constant risk of conflating. And this is the thing I want you to pay attention to in your work, that sometimes we conflate faith in the church with faith in God. They are not the same thing. For children, they can be. They can assume that faith in the church is also faith in God. And the other thing that's really important is to pay attention to that our image of God isn't God. So as funny as Gary Larson's image of God is, and you might say, yeah, that's kind of funny. You have to always ch check yourself and say, God is always bigger than what I'm thinking. And an adolescent doesn't know that unless someone's told them. Most adults don't know that unless someone's told them. Let me tell you, God is bigger than your image of God, no matter how lovely that image may be. Yeah. And the church is to serve the community's ever-expanding faith in God. That means we always have to be kind of pushing the boundaries on what it is we think we believe about the one we call God. And very often that church throughout history has failed miserably in doing that work. And I think this is one of those moments. One of the things we have to pay attention to when we're talking about the church and about faith is that the church is not a membership organization like so many others. You know? It isn't simply trying to get members, even to do good work. And it's not simply a good works organization. It's not saying, how can I get people to join the ranks, pay the bills, keep the lights on? How can we get people to join us? It's, more, it's not that. You have to have a community of people, but its first work is not that. Its first work is to be a community of belief. And what I mean by that is it offers a horizon about what life is about. How often, though, do you hear that spoken about in any kind of setting, right? A community of belief that's offering a meaningful horizon, an ultimate horizon about what life is really about. Okay. The term horizon is used in philosophical and theological um, sources to talk about what's ultimate. And I have a quote here from Hans George Gadamer, a German philosopher, who says, the horizon is the range of vision that includes everything that can be seen from a particular vantage point. A person who has no horizon does not see far enough and hence overvalues what is nearest to him. On the other hand, to have a horizon means not being limited to what is nearby, but being able to see beyond it. A person who has a horizon knows the relative significance of everything within this horizon, whether it is near or far, great or small. like the, the young adolescent who's just looking out of the boat and realizing there's a world outside the boat, they're only just beginning to perhaps appreciate that life is about something, that life is for something. Okay. When you identify a horizon, then life gains a direction, life gains a meaning, and everything gets prioritized in light of it. Whatever we consider is ultimate, then make sense of everything else. So whether that everything else is your job, your family, what's happening today, all of that gets oriented relative to this ultimate horizon. And when you fail to have a horizon, you're buffeted by whatever's immediate without any sense of orientation to what's most important in your life. 
To have meaning and purpose in life, I suggest, is about having some sense of ultimate horizon, some sense of something great out there, something meaningful, something purposeful. All right, again, I've spoken for a little bit. Now it's your time to think. I'm not doing all the thinking here. Consider your ultimate horizon. Now, I'm not asking you necessarily to say, to be the great philosophers, but just say, wait a minute, what do I think is most important in life? How does that determine how I spend my time and where I spend it and doing what? How much time do you allow yourself to think about those sorts of things? So just most of us are very busy, so we think, well, not, not much. But think about this for a moment, and if you would, have a chat with your nearest and dearest and say, well, this is one thing. So you'd, I'm suggesting ultimate horizon. Feel free if you have something that feels a little less ultimate. That's OK, too. <laughs> but think about that for What is life about? What is its purpose? And how does it determine how you spend your time and energy and where you spend it? Anyone, anyone interested to say something that occurred to them in just the conversation about this? It doesn't have to be you're telling me what your largest purpose is, your widest purpose. But even just, let's start with this. How many people found it really easy to talk about that right off the bat? Raise your hand. Ooh, there's a handful of people. I am impressed with that. Good. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges is that it's, people don't talk about this stuff. And so when you're turning to somebody else, younger, you're on the spot and you usually come up with really bad things. <laughs> right. But anybody, did anyone want to share a thought about what occurred to them in, the, in, the, in that? Yep. Um, I, I, I shared that um, as one matures, as I matured, I lost things. I lost loved ones. I lost jobs. I lost money. I lost possessions that I, all things I had previously valued enormously. And so perhaps, now that I'm thinking about it, because no, I don't have a lot of time to think about this or uh, have been invited to think about it, but perhaps the horizon is what's left when, when you lose or when you have seen other parts fall away. Mm -hmm. And what the value is, what the purpose is going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. That those things that are intermediate are, are disappearing, thinning out, and you can see it. And this is a really interesting thing about the concept of horizon. When do you get to the horizon? Never. It just keeps moving. So even as you grow and change and move, it's moving too with you. It's ever expanding. Dan? I find that on? Yes. Uh, it's not so much that I'm, I have a sense of my horizon or the, uh, what life is all about, but I'm finding that when I look towards outside myself and engage myself in the relationships with others more now than I ever did before in my life, that I look back and realize, wow, that is my purpose in life, and I'm much happier there being aware of my relationship with others and doing things for others than I ever was in my younger, year, younger years. Thank you. Yeah, and that's also another piece of it. Is there, it comes in, in response to something. You've done something. You think, that was more gratifying than anything else I've been doing. Why am I spending my time doing other stuff? So sometimes our awareness of what's valuable in life isn't because we came up with a really good idea. It's because our experience and our reflecting on that experience has informed um, what we've discovered to be meaningful. Thank you. So what is a meaningful life? You know? Sometimes, and I'm part of a, a new group of faculty uh, researchers over at the Lynch School of Education. I've, I've walked across the campus to make friends with new people who want to research, how do we research a meaningful and purposeful life? And I scurried over there to say, do you even know what it is you're looking for? Let's figure that out first. And it's been a really interesting process to say, sometimes people use the word meaningful, but in a completely meaningless way. Sometimes they use the word purposeful in a sentence, but in a purposeless way. 
You know, so you have to kind of pay attention what's behind the language. So what is a meaningful life? The Christian tradition offers a horizon, but we don't often think of it that way when we're saying things like the Nicene Creed. This is, I don't know if you can see that that well, but those of you who are familiar with saying this on a regular basis, this is the first stanza of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. It's been with the church since the fourth century. And we just might think, well, that's just some kind of odd code we say somewhere during the mass. I'm not even quite sure if I thought about it too long, I'd probably get confused. <laughs> I'm sure it's antiquated and whatever. But what this statement, this stanza is saying is that all life, everything we see, this church believes comes from one source. Everything, me, you, the furniture, the air we're breathing, our likes, our dis, everything, everything comes from one source. So what? That means, and this one source that we believe makes everything in love and is expanding constantly. What does that mean? It also means then that we believe that that creation that we're living in is not ultimately in conflict with itself. That everything here, everything that we can imagine is never outside the consideration and power of God. Not you, not me, not nasty people, nothing, nothing is outside God. You cannot get outside that which is making you. So the church believes that everything comes from one thing and returns to that one thing. And all of that happens with the power of love, this thing we call love. Edward Hannenberg writes of it in his book, Awakening Vocation. The infinite horizon of the human person is nothing less than the mystery of God. What grounds our knowing, as well as our choosing and our loving, is neither an unending emptiness nor absolute being. It is the God of Jesus Christ. God is the horizon that opens up the landscape and encircles our lives, calling us forward even as it constantly recedes before us. We can never capture the whole of it. We can never figure it all out. And it's not mystery because we haven't figured it out yet. It's mystery in that, where'd this all come from anyway? What are we doing here? The fact that there is life is itself mystery. And in this, from a religious perspective, we're not talking about the mechanics of it. We're not talking about Big Bang Theory or anything else. We're talking about that it is that we're living, that we're breathing, that there's anything to even talk about. What's that all about? And the Christian tradition says, it's about the God who seems to have made it all. And we can only know that God through our experience of what God has offered us in the knowing. So it will always be beyond us, because we are creatures. We are not the creator of it all. Okay? So then what do you do with that life? If that's the thing, if all life came from one thing, and it supposedly isn't in competition with itself, although you know, it might seem otherwise, what does that mean? How are we to live? And this is where we're grounded in the greatest commandment. As I'm using the Gospel of Mark here, one of the scribes asked him, which is the first of the commandments? And Jesus replied, the first is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. So this is the first order of business of life. It's not like I'll take care of that when I get everything else done. After I get the kids in bed, if I get my job taken care of, after I've dealt with the millions of obligations that I have, then I will get to loving my neighbor. If 
but first I've got real work to do. That's real life, and I don't know what this religious stuff is, but I'll do it when I've got time. Okay? Christian tradition is saying, no, the first thing we do and the last thing we do and everything else that we do in between is love. And if we do it, life goes well. Does it mean it's easy? Does it mean people don't die? Does it mean people don't get hurt? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. Right? What it means is that when we love, life is better. And when we fail to love, when we are more self-interested, self-serving, self-grabbing, people get hurt. Lots of people get hurt. I was sharing with somebody who's in the room a couple weeks ago. You never hear people suffering from PTSD for love. Humans are made in love and for love. We're made to be this way. And that's why when people are loved, they just kind of blossom. And they give it out. They become generous in themselves. However, when they have suffered from trauma or f ongoing fear or threat, they get smaller, they shrink, they hurt, they, they, have, they live in pain. That to me is one of the things that proves to them to be true. So people thrive in love. This world seems to have been made in love and for love. And so I'd suggest to you, that's the horizon that the Christian tradition offers. Right. But identifying that horizon is not a rival. <laughs> Just because I can know it doesn't mean I've gotten there. And as we've said before, you never get to a horizon. It's always still moving in front of you. Okay. And also what's important in this horizon is how you sail there. Right? How do I get there? I actually have to live in love in order to arrive at that place of love. So, as I said, so then the bigger question then becomes, how do you navigate towards a meaningful life? How do you get there? <laughs> this, is a, this is a tricky thing. What you're trying to teach basically is how do you engage people in loving in the world? How do you get them to believe that that's the thing to do when so much around them speaks the contrary story? So much around us says that really what's most important is get what you can for yourself or get what you can for at least the people you like, right? But not risk loving, especially don't risk loving people you don't like, right? Certainly don't risk loving people who you disagree with. Certainly don't risk loving people who look different from you, okay? And so it's very challenging to keep encouraging people to live in love, even to know that that's a thing to do. So I'm going to suggest some strategies for faith formation with adolescents. You know, and this is where you get out your notebook and say, oh good, now she's got to give us the answers. Yeah. Right. The first task you need to do is interpret and connect. So if I said one of the, the challenges of an adolescent is to figure out how to interpret the world well, you've actually got to help them interpret. How do you make sense of the world that's around you? Okay. Now, sailing looks like an easy thing. You push, wind pushes the sails, right? Isn't that how it goes? Easy peasy. No, it's not. You have to constantly interpret how the wind isn't pushing the sails, but interacting with the sails. Okay? And when you add more than one sail, it gets even more complicated, because now the two sails are interacting with each other, which then means that the wind that's around them is interacting with it. And that's what's going to determine if your boat's moving. Okay? You have to learn how to interpret that, and they interpret the relationship between them. You also have to interpret the water. I've been sailing races some nights that there's so little wind, the tide is moving us backwards. You're like, oh no, <laughs> we're, crossing, we're crossing the start line again. <laughs> You have to be able to interpret forces that are moving at counter purposes and figure out how do I use them in a way that benefits me? How do I use them so that we go forward in a way that's, that's helpful and appropriate? Interpreting the landscape around you is essential, not simply for sailing, but for life. What do people expect of me? How do I figure out what they're saying? How do I understand what's going on here? Okay. What happens in adolescence is that it becomes much more important that people talk to you. 
and that you listen to them. Because you need people who maybe have a clue as to how to read what's going on. Right? And so it becomes really essential in adolescence that you begin to have people who will take the time to listen to your own concerns and respond to them intelligently. Right? Listen to your own ideas and give you feedback and encouragement. Right? You need someone to help you interpret the world well. The first thing you're interpreting is yourself. Am I worthwhile? Am I of any value? Am I anything? Does anybody care? Right. This little image here was a, um, a very small plaque, like two by three inches, given to me when I had my confirmation by a, a very good friend to, um, who gets a dedication in the book. I still have this plaque. I'm sure she had no idea that it was as important to me as it was to, to her as when she gave it. But it had a tremendous message on it to me. What we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God, which means that we're always, in a sense, as I understood it, always giving back to God what God just gave us, right? And that it's an ongoing process. So this little plaque helped me kind of interpret my life in a certain way that my life was a gift, but it was a gift that I was constantly receiving and I was constantly returning. Right? What a tremendous gift that was, I think back to that. And that's why I still have the plaque and it's, it's on my desk at home next to me when I'm writing books like this, okay? I'm, so we need to help people see us and see our value. We do not do it alone. We also need to see other people and their value, that they're no longer just things. And it takes then the time for us, as we're growing, to start listening to people, not to assume that we know them. They say, oh, you've been my friend since I was four. You know, I know all about you. And we're saying, no, you don't know all about me. You know, take some time to listen to me. Take some time to hear my side of the story. Take some time to attend to what I have to say. You know? Interpreting ourselves and others along a horizon of love is careful work. It's graceful work, meaning it's full of grace. It gives us the opportunity to give and to receive love. Right? Call to mind those people in your life, significant and minor, who helped you see the value in yourself. Let's offer up a quick thank you for who they are. Another thing that's an important element within the Christian tradition is that my value cannot come at the expense of somebody else's, right? Which is also often a common way of looking at life. If I'm supposed to be good, then you've got to be bad. If I'm supposed to be great, then you have to be small, right? But the Christian tradition says, no, your value is grounded in the value of the other. If they're not valuable, then you're not valuable. But your value is wonderful and unique and beautiful, and their value too is. You've just yet to see it. Right? John Zizioulis, who's a Greek Orthodox uh, theologian, talks about our discovering our personhood in relationships. That we're just humans. Our nature as humans is just one of close to eight billion right now. There's nothing special about being a human. He said what makes us discover our unique humanity is when somebody recognizes us as a person. When they see us ourselves and they say, yes, you. Right? I hope and I expect everybody in this room has had somebody create that experience for them. That our sense of our value, our unique value, only comes when somebody else recognizes us and sees us for ourselves. If we're lucky, this doesn't happen just once, but it happens again and again over time with multiple people. 
Right? And this helps us ground our sense of our value in, in ourselves. We cannot talk ourselves into our own value. We actually need other people to help us discover it within ourselves. Right? Our value is, concerned, is connected to the value of all. And so if as, as I begin to appreciate that I'm somebody, I also have to start making the effort to discover that you're somebody. I have to start granting to you the graciousness that I hope is granted to me. And that's a practice that needs to be practiced in, throughout adolescence and hopefully then throughout adulthood. But it's only introduced at this time in life when people are beginning to say to you, get out of yourself, notice who else is around, pay attention to them, uh, and listen to them. Another important element of, it goes with the interpreting is making connections. Now I indicated before that the, the brain is growing and one of the interesting things about the brain is that it's creating new synapses, new connections among brain cells. Um, and what it uses again and again gets uh, protected, they get myelinated, they get kind of solidified and as brains do and whatever, you know, that might be too rigid a term, but they get strengthened, those pathways in the brain. And those, those pathways that maybe happen once, a single experience, a single event, those pathways get pruned over time. So your brain w grows in mass and then decreases in mass by the time you're in your mid-20s because the brain has pruned away stuff it didn't need very efficiently. So there's a great little use it or you lose it <laughs> metaphor that goes with the brain development at this time. And so one of the developments that needs to be prompted is the connections that are made among things. And while this adolescent is growing and making connections among ideas and among people and among concepts, their, their brain is literally making connections. And the more they do it, the more reliable and smooth and efficient those connections become. But if they never do that kind of stuff, they never get any good at it whatever those are. So you have to assist in making connections. Right? So one of the important uh, interpretive works that we have to do as a church is to make, make sense out of the tradition in a way that can then be accessed um, and valuable. So I'd suggest to you this, these concentric circles as a way of thinking about how we start making connections. If you look in the middle circle, I have suggested are practices. These are the things we do. This is the stuff that we ask for. So whether those are moral instructions, do this, don't do that, the Ten Commandments and so forth, or they're the sacraments and, and behaviors that we have or prayer forms, the stuff that you can teach a child and they will get right on the test if, you know, if prompted appropriately. But you get to adult and they begin they get to adolescence and they begin to say, why are we doing this stuff? I don't want to do it anymore. It seems stupid. And if the practices are just practices on their own, disconnected from anything else, you're right, they do seem stupid. And they seem like a waste of time. Stop it, right? So you have to be able to connect those seemingly innocuous or crazy practices with what's behind them. And it's offered to you that our practices are shaped by the values that we're trying to communicate. Right? Those values are then shaped by the ideologies that are around them. So in this situation, we're looking at a theological perspective. Okay? And that value, or those ideologies, are shaped by that ultimate horizon. What do we believe about what's ultimate? Now, if you're looking at an adolescent growing out of childhood, they're going to have been really well, well, they're going to be able to see the concrete, but they won't see the values behind it unless it's prompted, invited, encouraged, instructed, and not just once, but again and again and again, until people say, oh, I get it, and then they start teaching it for you and say, see, I, this is the way it works, right? But you have to start that conversation, and again, it's a lot about talking. It's a lot about communicating. So, for example, if we have moral instructions about um, do not kill, you know, do not harm people, don't hit your sister, um, or even instructions about sexual behaviors and injunctions against things, we might say, well, yeah, they seem like a silly list of to-dos or don't-dos, right? But if we begin to say, think more largely about, these are all grounded in a sense of the human person and the person's dignity, and value, right? 
So we don't kill because we value the creation that God has made in this person. We value where they are in the world and what they're offering us by their life. Right? We're, and, and if we want to live out these values, that's why we do these things. Right? Again, those values are shaped by ideologies that then order those values, which one's more important than another. Or in a given moment, how do two goods get organized and prioritized? So these are, can be kind of complicated ways of thinking, but when you start to think about how do I even just talk to an adolescent about what, why we do these things, it prompts you to say, well, what's the value behind it? Why do we do these things? What is the church hoping to communicate in them? And then you begin to broaden the conversation because then what happens is you begin to say, while the practices are important, the values behind them are more important. And sometimes then we need to say, the practice is no longer communicating the value. Or in a given moment, you can say to the adolescent, this practice isn't communicating the value that we care about. And so in this moment, we're not going to do that practice. Right? But you're showing them the inner workings behind how do we live a life of meaning and purpose within the Christian tradition. It's not simply follow the do list and don't follow the don't list. It's a way of thinking about how we engage with the world. It's a way of thinking about how do we live in love with one another. And that's very complicated in, in a given instance, especially in a very complicated world like we're living in. Okay. Another thing I would suggest is ballast. You have to provide ballast. My favorite part of the boat is the hull, or is the, um, is the keel on the bottom, because it means my boat won't tip over when the wind is strong. But one of the things that's problematic today is we expect a lot of young people to do things on their own and go out there in the, in the, in the weather on their own. And smaller boats, while agile and fun, also tip over very easily. So if you think about the tradition as ballast, then we can think about how do we offer that ballast in a meaningful way. So we have here, among one of the things that we have that's really valuable is our stories of who we are as a community of people. Alistair McIntyre says, for the story of my life is always embedded in the story of those communities for which I derive my identity, from which I derive my identity. I am born with the past, and to try to cut myself off from that past is to deform my present relationships. So we have to think about, well, what are the sources of our stories? Okay. For me, it's scripture, certainly, as a Catholic Christian, but it's also the stories of the saints, and these are the, my patron saints. I call them my bench. Right. So Saint Teresa of Lisieux, Saint Teresa of Avila, Saint Anne, the mother of Mary, and Saint Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary. These stories help and encourage us and direct us, and also they companion us. I am not alone even when I am by myself, for they are with me even if I can't see them. They provide direction and encouragement. I'm not going to take the time to read this one here, but this was the reading from last Sunday where the young man asked Jesus, um, what did he do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, give everything away, and the guy left downcast. And how much is that like a story of today where we're afraid that our, where our real salvation is in what we own and what we can gain and what we, our possessions and our income, our real security is in our income. And Jesus is saying, no, your real security isn't there. The third thing that we have to offer are practices that keep these things up. Something that we share together. You can't just say to the adolescent, go do those things because I'm sure they're good for you. <laughs> but never do them yourself. You actually have to invite people into practices as things that you find valuable yourself. And to go on with one of, the, one of my favorite lines is that you get good at what you practice and you never get good at what you don't practice. Okay? So if I'm looking here, these sailors in these round the world sailing boats, they're much better at sailing than I am, but they spend a whole lot more time doing it than I do. Okay? Similarly, when we're asking people to pay attention to the presence of God, it's something we have to practice. And our liturgical spaces and worship and practices aid us in that. They help us see God's presence outside that space. But I'd also suggest to you God's presence outside that space 
also informs what we bring to worship and prayer in religious spaces. Think of your religious practices that shape you or the things that you do on a regular basis that help keep you on course. The last thing I want to point to is relationships. Central to adolescence is recognizing that people are out there and that maybe you want to have a relationship with somebody, a friend, a romantic interest, even just business colleagues and coworkers. But one of the things that few people talk about, they say everyone's got to have relationships, you should have relationships, young people should have relationships. Nobody tells you how. And it's one of the really challenging things going on right now is that adolescents and young adults are, are told to get themselves a relationship without any indication as to how to do that. We are made for relationships. This is shameless plug number two. We are made for relationships, but we are not automatically good at them. In fact, we're lousy at them much of the time. They require practice. They require practices like listening and speaking so as to be understood and to understand. They require vulnerability. They require forgiveness. They require all sorts of stuff. Much of it messy, but a lot of it graceful, full of grace. Okay. And I'd suggest to you in religious communities that a really important element of this is what I call in the book robust relationships, particularly with non-parenting adults people who see you, know you, and value you still. Okay. Parents can, can be lots of things for their kids. They can never not be their parent. And we all know that as children, as, as parents, right? You can never not be your parent, and you can never not be the child of your parent. And that conversation is always loaded with all sorts of history and hopes. But another adult doesn't come with that stuff for you. And so we need to encourage non-parenting relationships with young people so that they can begin to even hear themselves think with somebody, test out ideas. Because in the world of relationships, everybody needs apprenticing. So there's my, there's my teacher. They are our sailing teacher. Similarly, relationships with Jesus have to be preceded by relationships with real people who love you. right? Belonging to a church has to be preceded by a community that's invited and is worth belonging. So the onus is on us to reach out, to be present, to be inviting, to be there. Okay. Edward Hannenberg says in another place in his book, communal structures of support and accountability, a shared vocabulary, regular rituals, time with friends and a place for fellowship, tasks to accomplish together, this is the stuff of church. Participation is a doing with and being with others. It is also to take part, to have a stake or to share something. Religion or church is not simply a resource from which I draw, it is an arena within which I act. I take part in something larger than myself and I do it with others. That's what religious communities are about. They're not simply membership groups. They're about something larger than ourselves and a community that shapes our vision and our interpreting of the world. So we finish with this thought. Ask yourselves, what stories provide your ballast? How do you make sense of life? Who is your community? And can you ever imagine inviting an adolescent to that and telling them why you like it so much? I suggest that's how you might help somebody navigate towards a meaningful life. Share with them how you're doing it. Invite them into the practice, into the community. Thank you.